Tonight on Greater Boston, I'll talk with Jason Tibbetts. He's a Brockton native living in Odessa, Ukraine, who's choosing to stay and support those fighting for freedom. Plus, two people who knew American journalist Brent Renault well. Renault was shot and killed by Russian troops in Ukraine yesterday while trying to cover the refugee crisis. And Putin's brutal attacks are not only alienating Russia among other world leaders, they're also turning many Russians beyond his borders against him including the majority of those living in the U.S., according to a new survey. We'll look at that and how President Biden's pro-Ukrainian efforts are being perceived with Suffolk University pollster David Bailey Logos. Over a weekend where the biggest complaint for most Americans was losing an hour to daylight saving, Putin's assault on Ukraine has intensified, with Russia targeting more residential areas, including bombing an apartment building in Kyiv, and in Mariupol, which has been leveled by Putin's forces, tens of thousands of Ukrainians remain stranded without food, water, heat, or a way out. A few hundred people were able to flee safely today after days of attacks on refugee caravans. Nearly three million people have left Ukraine so far, although remarkably some, reportedly around 200,000, are now making their way back to Ukraine to stand with the millions who stayed to protect their country just the latest example of the awe-inspiring bravery we've seen from the Ukrainian people and those who are trying to help them. Among them is Brockton native Jason Tibbetts. He's a former U.S. Army medic who joins me now from Odessa, where he's been living and teaching English for the past 10 years. Jason, it's good to meet you. Thanks much for being here. Thanks for having me. So it's late at night in Odessa, a strategic port city on the Black Sea. What's the situation there now? Um, well, uh, at this time of night, everybody keeps their lights out. We have a curfew that starts at 10 p.m. And so we're locked in our buildings from 10 p.m. till 7 in the morning. Uh, during the daytime, there's uh, a lot of fear in the city. There are messages every day, of course, that, that we're going to be attacked and friends and, and, and well-wishers and people write, you know, I heard on the news, I heard rumors. So there's a lot of fear. Uh, the city is mostly a ghost town uh, full of uh, elderly people, children, and people with uh, nowhere else to go, uh, really, at this point in time. Do you feel that fear yourself? Uh, not as much as they do. Um, I, I, I see it in them, and to me, it's um, a little bit stressful to kind of deal with uh, a lot of those messages that I get about kind of, you know, worrying and the, the everyday, you know, th that we're kind of expecting it. But I don't feel a lot of the fear. I feel a lot of sympathy, I suppose, for the people that are here. Um, I suppose I'll feel fear when, when the time actually comes. But at this point in time, no. Uh, I, which amazes me. I mean, beyond being, you're the, as you know, obviously, the mayor of Odessa said as recently as Friday that uh, an invasion, an attack by the Russians was imminent. I'm sure you see the same image as we do of uh, sure. women, pregnant women murdered at that hospital, uh, uh, children being killed. How do, you, how do you wrap your head around that after being in this country for 10 years under in a totally different world? You can't wrap your head around it. It's It's absolutely impossible to look at those images and to, to see that that woman uh, being carried off or families being shot and just the the evil that would commit such actions it's it's impossible uh, to do it's it's just complete sadness that someone could do that and sadness that a life could be extinguished, that a baby could die before it even, ha even has the chance to take a breath uh, inside of its mother's belly. It should have been the proudest moment of her life, instead completely destroyed. Yet despite the violence all around you and the violence that's supposedly coming to your city relatively soon, you've chosen to stay. Why? Someone has to help. Um, I was a medic, as you mentioned, in the military. Mm -hmm. And I mean, that hardly qualifies me to be the best person to, to help out here or to do kind of the most useful things. But with so many people leaving and uh, protecting their own family, 
um, there has to be someone uh, who can, you know, maybe lend a hand. And if I were to leave, I don't think that that would be something that uh, on my own conscience that I would be able to deal with. How are you preparing? Are you preparing? Yeah, of course. What are you doing? Uh, um, um, well, first off, preparing in the sense of I've contacted the local uh, the local military here, and um, I will when and if an attack comes, um, they will contact me, tell me where to go, where I can work, where I can help out, and um, so I guess that's about it. And for as far as me personally preparing, it's of buying a lot of oatmeal, a lot of tuna. Um, taping up the windows as you would in these situations and um, being ready for kind of a long haul and, and doing what I can um, at that point in time. But I suppose that you can't really be prepared other than just as much as possible, stay calm, be ready, and when the time comes, um, act. I'm sorry to stay on this same topic, but it's so, I mean, I, I can't, I can't get the heroism that I see and the kinds of things you say. You're gonna to go to bed in a little while. Do you yeah. not go to bed with trepidation that you're gonna be awakened in the middle of the night by a flash or by the sound of a missile landing near you? Or do you just go to bed and get up tomorrow morning and do yet another day? How do you do this? Um, I know that a lot of people don't sleep at all. Um, I know that they're up all night posting, they're waiting for that to happen. We know that the rockets do come at 420, 4 a.m. That's the most uh, common time for Russia to launch the attack on cities. But, you know, I, I suppose for me personally, um, no, I, <laughs> I listen to, to, to some, you know, calming music and, and try to kind of get away from social media for about 30 minutes or so before bed because... What can you really do? I mean, running around in circles and, and being fearful of, of something that might happen tomorrow or might not happen tomorrow isn't going to do me any good or the people I try to help any good. So, yeah, I, I do sleep. I wake up a lot uh, throughout the night. I wake up about two or three times, yeah. but but I'm able to go back to sleep uh, at least. You know, you got to hours. know Ukrainian people up close for the 10 years you've been there. Could you have foreseen uh, uh, an old man kneeling down in front of a Russian tank or a retired university professor, a woman in this case, building matter-of-factly Molotov cocktails in her backyard to distribute to her neighbors. Could you have imagined this kind of no. heroism? No, absolutely not. I, I think that uh, I will tell you that a lot of people when I first came to the country, were supportive of Russia. They would look back on the Soviet Union and, and as as people you know might do when they, when they get to older years, kind of that you know the past was better. And certainly there was uh, a lot of positive feeling. Even uh, uh, you know even people that I personally know a few weeks ago had positive feelings towards Russia, but all of that positive feeling is gone. There is none of that now. There is just, you know, you are not going to take our land. What you have done is just pure evil. And the people that might have liked or glorified the Soviet Union or might have even liked Vladimir Putin and thought he was somehow a better leader, no. And the country and the people have just really unified. And I am so surprised, so shocked, and so proud of how the Ukrainian people have stood up to an army that is you know, so much bigger, so much stronger, but certainly not that well organized. As I said, you're a Brockton kid. Do you think your government, the United States government, is doing enough to help the Ukrainian people? No, I absolutely do not. What I should it do? That, I think that they need to block the skies. I think that that's what Ukraine uh, continues to ask. I understand. Personally, I feel that Biden's comments about World War III are creating a lot of fear that doesn't need to be created. I don't think that that's the situation with Russia. If we look back at what Russia did with Georgia and when Russia brought the tanks to Georgia, and if you look at Saakashvili, who was then the president of Georgia in his comments and what he said at the time, um, it was leaked. 
that the United States was going to send military to Georgia and Cheney, uh, they were going to launch cruise missiles. And Russia stopped at that point in time uh, within 40 minutes of that information being leaked. So what Vladimir Putin is saying and the threats that he's making, they're completely hollow. They're not real. He's not a madman, but he knows if he makes those threats, we will back down. And that's unfortunately currently the situation. And at what point are we going to step in? At what point are we going to help? Like you mentioned, 80 children have now been killed in 16 days. Um, you know, like you said, pregnant women, families being massacred, a country that has helped us. We have signed, we signed the Budapest Accord with them. In the 1990s, Ukraine had the third most nuclear weapons in the world. And we signed an agreement with them that we would protect their sovereignty if something happened. And, and, and where does that even, what does our word even matter as a country if we don't keep the agreements we make? And how can we tell other countries to demilitarize or, de or take their nukes away if, you know, we don't keep, you know, the, the things that we promise? And I was certainly no fan of Bush, by the way. Um, no fan of him uh, by any stretch of the imagination. But we need to protect Ukraine's skies and stand up to Vladimir Putin because if we do not, and he is able to take Ukraine, I don't know what we think the result is going to be, in all honesty. That Mr. Putin's going to go back to Russia with a lost war. There's only, you know, three results here. He's either going to, uh, you know, if there's a chance that he could potentially lose, he'll turn the country to ash, in my opinion, before he goes back to his own country with a loss. And if he's able to take this country, it's going to be a stronger Russia that's then going to turn their eye towards Moldova and the other non-NATO countries if we say, you know, NATO is somehow that line and he'll continue to grow. And right now, we have a chance where Russians do not support Mr. Putin. They're very negative against him. And we really, if we stand up to him now, I think we'll save a lot of lives and prevent a lot of problems later. Jason, best to you and your Ukrainian neighbors. I really appreciate your time. Thank you, too. And uh, greetings from Odessa. Dakoyu. That's how you say thank you in Ukrainian. Thank you to you, too. Thanks, Jason. Among the many killed in Ukraine over the past few days was American journalist Brent Renault. According to his reporting partner, Juan Arredondo, they were shot after passing a checkpoint in the earpin in a car as they were on their way to film refugees fleeing the fighting. Arredondo was wounded as well, but survived. He and Renault had been working on a film for Time Studios about the global refugee crisis. Ukrainian officials say Russian forces were responsible. Renault is the 2019 Harvard Neiman Fellow and Peabody Award-winning documentarian who worked for HBO, NBC, and The New York Times. He covered some of the most dangerous conflicts in the world, including wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, the Haiti earthquake, and cartel violence in Mexico. How many people do you think that you've killed? Unas 15 personas. Uh, 15 person. How old were you the first time you killed somebody? ¿Qué edad tenías cuando mataste a la primera persona? 15 años. 15 years old. Do you have any regrets about what you do? En el primero sí, ahorita ya no. That's the 2011 documentary, Arming the Mexican Cartels, which won a DuPont Columbia University Journalism Award. I'm joined by correspondent Christoph Putzel, who you just saw in that clip, and Anne-Marie Lipinski, who got to know Renault well at the Harvard Neiman Foundation, where she's curator. I thank you both for being here. Christoph, I know he was a very close friend of yours. You described him as the best war journalist ever. Why? Because Brent had courage like nobody I've ever seen, yet at the same time had this heart to go into where he knew he was needed. And he was so incredibly careful and focused. And this is a combination where you have, where you score one, where you score a 10 out of 10 in all of those. I don't know many people that can do that. And that's what I think made Brent so good. I heard you say, Christoph, in some interview, uh, and this has stayed with me, that no matter where he was in the world, no matter what the conflict was, he looked like he blended in. What did you mean by that? Brent was a chameleon. <laughs> Brent could walk into any country, go through any checkpoint, any border, into any community, and somehow he looked like he belonged. Even in Africa. This is a white guy from 
Little Rock, Arkansas. Mm -hmm. And he could walk in and made people just feel like he belonged there and he was worthy of their story. Anne-Marie, what can you tell us about uh, Brent's work? Um, you know, I had a call today from um, Kevin Cullen from the Boston Globe, mm -hmm. and he said, I keep reading these quotes from you, and you keep using the word humanity to describe Brent. And I'm not, I don't know if when we were together, I ever thought of him that way, but reviewing his work and really thinking deeply about him the last couple of days, it just keeps coming to mind. And the work, the, the excellence in the work is not the result of, you know, some technical prowess he possessed, though he did possess that. He just had um, such a fundamental empathy and um, uh, humility, and it just came through. And I think to me, Brett, as a, if you're the focus of a story he's doing, would be to feel so, um, if not instant instantaneously, eventually so comfortable that you were not, you weren't, you weren't talking to a camera, you weren't maybe even talking to a journalist, you were talking to somebody who was deeply interested in your story. And I think that's what really comes through in his work. I read you, you said in the Globe, he's one of the kindest people you'd ever met, which was really touching. Juan Arandondo, the photographer with him, uh, is also a work through the Neiman program and is apparently recovering from what I understand, Anne-Marie. I, um, I was finally able to talk to Juan today. Oh, great. Um, he phoned me. Um, he's still hospitalized. He endured a, a, a second surgery. Um, so he's got a little ways to go, but the hope is that he recovers and can be, ex you know, returned to the U.S. soon. Christoph, uh, the, the whole concept of running into a burning building or choosing to work in a war zone is totally alien to me and I'm guessing to many of our viewers. Can you describe why your friend chose that? Because Brent cared more about the story and the truth than anything else. We all have our values, you know, and this was at the top of Brent's value list. He would go straight in there, um, full courage, um, have his wits about him and come out with the story because people trusted him. And that was his talent. And why would somebody do it? Because they care that much. You know, Brent's level of empathy was so deep. Um, he felt so connected to everyone and also knew that if he really felt that if he didn't get the story, a lot of people would never hear it. You know, and, and Marie, we all know that Putin is uh, busy muzzling journalists at home up to 15 years in jail for what he deems fake news and muzzling them there, now killing them in Ukraine. Are we doing enough to protect people like Brent Renault when they do their work? Um, well, I, I think that there, uh, one of the things I've been reflecting on since Brent died is that um, there are a lot of people in this country who helped, who have helped create a climate for the kind of um, brutality and disdain um, that so many journalists meet when they're out in the field. And so, you know, some of those bearing responsibility for the environment in which journalists are now working are all those who, you know, dismiss journalists quite publicly as, you know, so-called fake news and gave succor to despotic leaders around the world um, to, do as, to do as they will. When you hear, uh, speaking of fake news, when you hear uh, Vladimir Putin use Donald Trump's fake news term, Anne-Marie, what, what, how does that strike you? Um, uh, it's precisely what I was just talking about, and I think you, you see it in Putin surely now, but we've seen it in the Philippines, in Brazil, in Hungary, in Poland, in so many places where that rhetoric just became so commonplace and accepted, and we, we kind of sanctioned it. You know, but Anne-Marie, you know, even uh, above and apart from, let me call it the Trumpian effect here, for lack of a better expression, didn't it, several years ago, I think I read the UN passed a resolution unanimously saying that journalists in war zones should be considered civilians, but when people like Putin consider civilians target, the resolution means nothing, right? Right. 
Right. You're you're no you're no safer than the civilians we've seen shot dead um, in the in the past three weeks. So, Christoph, when people like me at night sit on our couch and feel helpless when we watch what's happening to uh, the Ukrainian people, innocent Ukrainian people, and then we watch what happened to your good friend Brent Renault, what do we do to to support work like his to help? protect people like him if we can. What can we do? Keep watching the news. Think about somebody like Brent, who was only able to do what he was able to do because he reached deep inside of himself to see what he was capable of and just went for it and sharpened himself over and over again. And all of us have that ability in our own way, everybody watching at home. Right now, we're watching one of the scariest moments uh, uh, in most of our lifetimes that we've ever seen. And I understand that feeling of powerless, trust me, I, I, I know it well. But that's when we reach deep inside of ourselves and you figure out who are you and who are you going to be in this time and what do you do with what you know? Anne Marie, what can we do? I, you know, I agree and I think we have to also very um, publicly and consistently fight back against the kind of dismissive um, uh, hostility that we have heard um, level against the press that we hear throughout the world, but even in this country where First Amendment protections, mm. um, you know, will not protect people from uh, journalists from some of the ill that they've experienced. Um, I think journalists need to do a better job of articulating um, the work that they do. I think we've not been transparent enough historically about the work that we do. And I think, you know, to, to emulate the work that, you know, Brent stood for, the values he possessed. He, you know, one of my fellows who was in his class was talking Sunday about one of the things he remembers about Brent. And he said something um, to him that really changed the way he thought about his work. He said, you know, it's okay to love your subjects. Um, and I, and, and I think there is, there are these traditions where we fight back against that in journalism and we impose distances. And sometimes that's appropriate. You're covering politics or city hall, um, but it's not always appropriate. And I think you see in Brent's work, his ability to love his subjects. I love that you said that. Anne-Marie Lipinski, Christoph Putzel, thank you so much for your time. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Putin's brutal assault on Ukraine has had many unintended consequences so far. Among them, uniting most of the world against them. That includes those with Ukrainian and Russian roots right here in the U.S., according to a new Suffolk University USA Today poll, which found a vast majority of both groups oppose the invasion. And those of Russian descent strongly favor Ukrainian President Zelensky, believing Putin should be removed from office by a margin of 9 to 1. The man behind those numbers and many more, director of Suffolk polling, David Paley Logos, joins me now. David, it's good to see you. Thanks for having me. I think this went up a second ago. Feelings on recent invasion of Ukraine among Russians living in the U.S. almost unanimous, 87 to 3. When I read that lopsided number, I said a lot of Russians came to this country to escape Soviet Russia, communism. Though the number is huge, not that surprising. Is it or is it? No, not that surprising, but the intensity level was really high. I mean, President Zelensky of Ukraine has really upped the the, the ante in terms of his his anti-Russia uh, um, um, stance. And, you know, a lot of these folks of Russian heritage have family members back in Russia. So I expected the opposition, but That's I didn't expect it to be this high. You know, I, I was also surprised, maybe I shouldn't have been, that my major takeaway from your piece is that on most, but not all issues, Ukrainians here and Russians here view both this invasion and the key players almost exactly the same way. Did that surprise you at all? Absolutely. It was incredible. I mean, over eight and ten disapprove of 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 uh, Putin, want him removed from office. Even seventy percent of Russians here want him charged with war crimes. And we and when we asked them to, you know, uh, describe Vladimir Putin in one word, they came up with every superlative that is hateful, uh, you know, against somebody. And again, th this is the person, you know, um, you know, whose relatives are still in Russia, who's the the president of that country. And and uh, you know, that kind of consistency I did not expect. You know, uh, uh 
we spoke earlier in the show tonight to a young man from Brockton who's a teacher now and has lived in Ukraine for 10 years. And he, with a passion, felt that his country, the United States, was not nearly doing enough. A majority of Russians living in the United States, 70%, I think it was, of Ukrainians in the United States also feel that the United States is not doing enough to help the Ukrainians, correct? That's absolutely true. And this is a this is a problem, and this is really where the major difference is between Russian heritage and Ukrainian heritage. Seven in 10 Ukrainians say the US is not doing enough. Only about 50% of Russians say the same thing. So there's a big gap there. And when we ask the question about, well, what should the United States do? You know, uh, those uh, folks who are Ukrainians were saying, you know, two, three quarters high, tighter economic sanctions, military hardware, which we would expect. But Ukrainians want U.S. troops. They want, you know, a majority of Ukrainians want U.S. troops in the NATO region, and over one in three want U.S. troops on the front lines to fight Russia. Yeah. That could be a tipping point in terms of a public opinion. But even though there's a 20-point gap in terms of, uh, as we just said a minute ago, about the U.S. doing enough, when it comes to, which is a natural segue to me, of how Biden is doing handling this conflict, they're walking lockstep again. Uh, only 40 percent of Russians in the U.S. approve, 35 percent of Ukrainians uh, approve. And that was, by the way, just to be clear, this is after the conflict started, correct, those numbers? That's right. You know, we made a, we made a very uh, important decision after February 24th when this happened because uh, to go into the field and scrap a couple of midterm polls uh, and to swap those out, not knowing whether the conflict would be over in a week and the poll would be useless or whether or not it would be an inflection point for something bigger. But you're absolutely right. Biden's number is lower than they are among the average American voter. Now, these aren't all voters. They're residents of the U.S. of different heritages. Yeah. Um, but, you know, um, on the flip side, there was a lot more undecideds, too. So they kind of had a wait and see attitude and the disapproval wasn't as high as it is right now in the U.S. I only have 30 seconds left. Going beyond Russians and Ukrainians in the U.S., you wrote a piece before the conflict started saying this could be a tipping point for Joe Biden. Is there any evidence you see, even if it's only creeping at this point, that there is a rallying around the flag effect or no? Yeah, I mean, I, th I, I depends on how it, it resolves itself. So uh, this is an opportunity for Joe Biden to do what he hasn't been able to do with American voters, which is convince them that he is a strong leader. And our polling, only 35 percent of voters said that he was a strong leader. This is the kind of opportunity that uh, Joe Biden could step up and make a difference and potentially change the trajectories of congressional candidates this November. For his benefit and for the benefit of the Ukrainian people. Uh, David Paleologos, thanks as always. Of course. That's it for tonight. We'll be back tomorrow. Thank you for watching. Please stay safe.